Uh, good evening, everybody. It's um, good to be back, um, I think, virtually a year on, um, when we were talking about our ability to cross the sustainability chasm, I think, was the last challenge Green Mondays gave us. And uh, I think that was, was really helpful thinking, and I know a lot will come out um, of the various roundtables uh, later on. So thank you for, for helping us in, in essentially what is an early part of our net positive journey. I'm just going to talk... Um, briefly about three or four things. Firstly, just what net positive is for, for Kingfisher, which is really, so what does it mean? Why, why would it be important? Um, I'm then going to do a sort of brief touch on a deep dive on what does net positive mean in the timber area. It was one of our four areas. Really just try and bring it to life a bit and talk about some of the practicalities that are involved. Um, I'm then going to um, talk about some of the challenges that we see, and, and there are um, certainly no shortage of those. Uh, and then finish on some sort of thoughts of, of tips. And I'm going to try and do all that in a maximum of 20 minutes. And I think we're then doing a session with a panel so there'll be an opportunity for Q&A. So um, try and keep this um, relatively um, brisk, basically. Um, net positive for us is part of uh, the way we need to do business in the future. It is not a separate strategy. It's one part of our eight point um, creating the leader strategy because it essentially under pins the way we want to run and develop the business going forward. And it really comes out of a belief that you cannot have in the future an unsustainable business model and still expect to be around as a business and attract investment, attract talent in particular. So we think the business ultimately will have to work out business by business, what, you know, what's its own contribution? How can it make it happen? But we've been through uh, a journey of, um, I think, discovery and development as Zach said, we launched this uh, late last, relatively late last year, so we're in less than year one of, of trying to go with net positive. But I think it builds on Kingfisher's heritage, going back to, in particular, the timber agenda uh, with Ray Baker here and others, uh, back to the sort of late 80s, early 90s. And in some senses, it's a continuation. But I think the thing we found um, and why it matters to us is that as we started to think about, well, where can we go? And if you're going to be a leader, what does a leader look like in this area? It became more and more um, obvious to us that simply being less rubbish or, or less sort of evil um, is probably a good thing, and I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, countenance against it, but it wasn't really very exciting, motivating. It didn't really get people going. Whereas we started to kick around the idea of if we could take a, a limited number of areas and really make a difference, really challenge ourselves uh, and our partners and our collaborators more broadly, that we could go beyond just zero, and sustaining was a sort of okay thing. But actually, most of us would like to create a legacy. We believe in, in what we leave behind. Most of us would like to feel like we all work for organizations that are a force for good. And particularly in an era when I think business is, is quite rightly, and possibly ironically here in the heart of the city, being attacked for being socially useless, um, I think there is a real challenge for leadership to step up and say, well, actually, no, this is our contribution. And what we found it interesting there was the ability to say, you could try and do everything. And obviously, there are some things you should do. You know, we should use less of, uh, you know, yes, less energy, yes, obviously, less waste, yes, you should pay your taxes, do various things. But actually, where's the leadership breakthrough challenge? And what made Net Positive interesting for us was, was it forced us to ask ourselves, what's our unique contribution? And certainly, one of the things I would challenge people in the room is that this will mean very different things for different organizations, and you shouldn't get caught in a, a one-size-fits-all. This is, for us, about timber, it's about energy, it's about innovation, it's about community. We will still do our foundation-level things. Um, you know, we will not lose sight of uh, the wonderful Sharon, the skip diver from B&Q, who saved us a fortune on landfill tax and is, is challenging our thinking. But we want to make a breakthrough in those areas. And we realized that to do this, we would have to go through, if you like, a sustainable uh, sort of state into becoming net positive. And so this is very much a 20 uh, plus year vision. So we're not kidding ourselves that this is something you can do tomorrow. But it's the right ambition direction of travel to have, because ultimately, that challenge of becoming a, a net generator, a net positive contributor, um, I think will engage organizations and the people inside and out in a way that nothing else will. So for me, the absolute heart of this is about the people in the business and the people that we touch in our supply chains and our customers. Um, because I think that's the key to making progress and challenging people with that, getting them excited about it, 
and then going on a journey and recognizing it is a hell of a long journey in some cases. So net positive for us, as I said, has become a way of business, one of our, our, our sort of core areas. And um, I'll talk about timber in particular, but just briefly on energy, the vision there would be, yes, we want to help start by helping our customers uh, reduce the amount of energy they use in their home. It's one of the core challenges for the, uh, the new model economy. Actually, the more interesting thing is, could you let them become net generators of energy in the future? And if you ever want to get a customer really excited in a research group, describe to them the idea they won't have to pay British Gas a bill again <laughs> in the next 20 years, so they get very motivated. Um, but we think that, that that can happen in a number of different ways. Um, uh, in innovation, this is essentially trying to rethink our business models in a uh, closed-loop cradle-to-cradle model, uh, which is really trying to bring the circular economy alive. And again, the first steps in this is trying to find a 1,000 products that we can move into that are clearly in a completely different level of impact and, and start to allow us to do something you know, quite profoundly different. Um, and then in community, we believe, you know, retailers, we've got 1,000 stores across Europe and China. We are in 1,000 communities plus. Actually, what could we do beyond just showing up, providing employment and paying our taxes? And there we think by providing skills for people to do more in their homes and then connecting them with initiatives like Street Club to help each other, we would have an, a net beneficial impact on, on, the, uh, on that local community. Now, why all this is Im important is I think um, you can't have a sustainable business in the future without some form of ambition in this area. And for us, I'm very keen to stress to people in the business, this is about the business being a high-quality, long-term, uh, positive business in the future. But it is a business, and we are not an NGO, we're not a charity. So in each of these areas, there is a business case because that connects the DNA of a commercial organization to make sure it keeps working on these things. So yes, I'm very interested in timber. Actually, I've got a risk of about 45 to 60 million pounds bottom line cost if I don't protect and grow my sustainable timber sources because of the pressure uh, coming on there. Equally, if I look at energy efficiency, 70 billion euro opportunity in Europe for, for us in terms of top line. If I look at innovation, we think there's a sort of two billion plus a year opportunity, even based on, on where we are now with our current uh, one, one Planet Home products and eco products. And if I look at community, we have seen in some evidence with the RSA that if we are positively perceived in communities where we're better perceived than in some stores where we're not as well perceived, our like for like and our store performance is better. So this is quite hard-headed, but it's trying to reframe business that says you should positively plan to have an impact and think very carefully about where the impact is because that will underpin your longer-term business. And I personally um, am convinced of this, and I, and I think what I've been really encouraged by is the reaction that people have had as we've developed the idea of net positive. I think we did shamelessly steal the name from Rio Tinto. I was a bit upset to see someone got the name first, but I'm reconciled to the idea we're now developing a movement. Kingfisher will play its role, be it you know, b and in the UK, Castor in France, or, or elsewhere. But actually, these are things that we're going to have to do in a collective sense, because no one's got the answers at the moment. So I'm convinced of this. I'm personally been involved in, in various forms of of uh, interest, and I probably date it back to having grown up in slightly odd parts of the world, in Africa and Asia, and I've been in um, basically some, a rainforest at the age of sort of five, and then get, went back as a teenager, and it left a very lasting impact of the reality of what we have got uh, if we're, uh, to lose if we're not careful, but also the sheer richness and variety of it. And what's been wonderful for me is, is being able to be involved in, in career terms with a business that A, had a heritage in this, but B, was able to do more. And I think I'm not particularly, in that sense anyway, unique. Uh, I think there are lots of people who feel responsible, who want to get involved, who want a positive challenge. And the thing which I'm totally convinced by is that if we put the right sets of partnerships together, we will see uh, some really interesting results. And we're at the stage now of saying, right, we've taken a plunge. We're trying to cross the chasm that you challenged us uh, <coughs> last year. We absolutely don't know all the answers, and um, we're not going to pretend we do, and, and that shouldn't stop us from getting started, because actually it's about getting started and moving on the journey. But to bring it to life, if we just talked a little bit about timber as an example, and we obviously were joined the FSC back in 91, uh, we've been involved in, in this, and being q last year became the first UK retailer to be 100% uh, certified responsible source product. Now, it's important for us because it's a third of our <coughs> products uh, contain some form of um, paper, timber or paper. 
And it's important because our scale matters here. And, and I'm afraid I keep boring it with the same statistic, but the group consumes a forest the size of Switzerland every year, and that's a really big spot. You know, that is a thing you can visualize and think, that's my impact. If we get it right or wrong, we will have that sort of impact. And we are very dependent on the source of that sustainable timber being around. Uh, as other retailers figure out they need to do this, demand is going to grow faster than supply. So we've got an absolute bulletproof reason to want to get involved in rapidly growing the source, uh, the, the supply of sustainable timber around the world. Now, for us, the timber challenge, and this goes to the point that was raised about measurement, you've got to decide, well, what is your measure and how do you do it? Now, if you sort of give us a little bit of sort of slack, because it is sort of year one of doing this, and I think we are spending a lot of time on KPIs and working out, is this the right one, is that the right one? And that's where I think this network can really come together to help everyone by, by doing the sort of thinking heavy lifting. But what we've said is, look, step one is get all our timber sustainable. <clears throat> now, the UK's there. The group overall is about 83 84%. We have got a way to go. And in places like China, frankly, that's really going to be very difficult because uh, it's not, you know, step one would be to have legal timber and step two would legal and sustainable. It is very hard to find some of these places. You, um, you go to Russia... Uh, actually, they're very into their timber, but they don't have a word for sustainability. They're not desperately interested in any of that. Um, so actually finding uh, an answer there in these countries will be hard. But step one is we get to as close to 100% sustainable timber as we can. Step two is we get involved in restorative projects, uh, which actually push us into creating uh, more, more, more in the way of sustainable supply. And that's not as simplistic as just you take one tree and you plant another, regardless of, if you like, the ecosystem around it. Um, what it is, however, is looking at sort of two, two examples we're working on. One is a sort of working woodlands project. Uh, I think the latest incarnation title of this is Good Woods, where we are taking 10,000 hectares in the UK and creating a local wood fuel supply chain. And that's, um, I think, unlocking something which is a latent supply-demand mismatch, which... You know, we would like to sell local wood fuel, and it's, we're not talking about shipping pellets to Drax or something. This is very much a, a local scale. The local woodland owners are typically uh, not able to find the outlet, and so actually there is an astonishing uh, hectareage in this country of undermanaged woodland, uh, which is sitting there doing, doing nothing. It's actually worse for, for biodiversity, because actually the better you manage it, the more likely you are to get species and, uh, and life coming back into it. And it's also a massive job creator. We think that the, um, the, the woodland piece could be uh, quite comfortably a sort of one billion gross value added opportunity in the UK uh, and uh, over 15,000 jobs, again, in rural areas. So this is sort of thinking about how do I unlock a whole economic system which will create a flow of product which we will be able to retail but actually creates an enduring uh, reuse of, of land which is currently in, in, in woodland which is not really being used. The other area we're looking at is tripartite deals, um, probably more overseas with uh, governments into reforestation and the tripartite element is with funders because one of the challenges about reforestation is the time lag. You know, you, you don't get these things sort of popping back overnight. But if we can create genuinely uh, effective reforestation, particularly of marginalised land that is on the edge of core uh, you know, and, and helps protect core, core rainforests in particular, but also other types of forestry, I, I think we can generally bring back into production um, in a truly sustainable way uh, a significant hectareage, particularly if we can work with other players in the industry. Now, if I can get to my sustainable uh, timber, say I, I probably can't get to 100% everywhere, if I'm being really honest, even on a 20-year view. If I get to 90% and I know I can do significant other efforts uh, that gets me into net positive territory, then by 2030, I think I can sort of see how we do this in, in uh, the timber area. <laughs> Frankly, it's much more of a challenge <clears throat> in some of the other areas, notably in innovation, because it takes quite a long time to change. The metrics in something like innovation are much more complicated. But from my point of view, I can start to see four roadmaps now, and they have to have annual KPIs and five- and ten-year KPIs. I think if you can't describe the progress you're making, it's very hard to keep the energy going, and it's very hard to, to see, you know, how do you get people motivated. Um, but I think in all of those areas, <coughs> we can come up with the answers. And I think what I'm completely convinced by 
is the ingenuity that we've got. It, it, I, I, we've not yet started with this. It's like, if you've never put the exam question before in this way, why is it surprising that we haven't got the answers? I think it's because we've never framed it this way. And I think if we start saying, right, how do I have a net positive impact, and what are my areas, and how do I measure it, and I would keep on banging on about measurement, I think we'll find whole new sets of opportunities, whole new sets of ideas that we just haven't had before. So in that sense, I'm an optimist. I don't believe it all is going to come from technological solutions. I think a lot of this is about getting the right sets of people together and creating networks that unlock uh, systemic problems. But at the heart of it, it's an ambition that says, I'm not prepared just to be uh, a sort of zero impact. I think we should do more, and I'm convinced that that will bring opportunities for us. Now, that's, the, if you like, the positive bit. The challenge is, um, <clears throat> one is, as a public company, um, this is quite scary stuff for quite a lot of investors. They're sort of a little bit unsure, A, what you're talking about, and B, is this going to make money or is this going to cost them a lot of money? I think gradually this will become common parlance, and I think people will get used to it. But if I had to sort of you know, g give you a watch out, it would be don't expect the investment community to fall over themselves and congratulate you for taking this route. This will, this will require quite a lot of explanation. Um, secondly, I, I'd say... This is something that, that requires some real honesty about the KPIs and measures, which is not, not straightforward. I mean, this is, um, if you leave it as a sort of vague, sort of hot air ambition, I think you'll right, quite rightly be absolutely caned by your stakeholders and the people inside your business. So the sooner you can get it down into detail, um, the better. Um, and then the, I think the sort of third challenge is trying to then find... <coughs> ways and means of continuing to push. This is something that is 20 years sort of time scale. It's quite hard to get that across. So from my point of view, um, I think the, uh, the, the sort of tips, the sort of final bit I'd say is um, give yourself enough time to do this. This is not something you can just sort of say, right, aha, I've cracked it. I mean, this is, this is quite thoughtful, deep stuff. And I think give yourself time to develop your metrics, as I said. But also give yourself enough time in the organization. Talk to people in the organization. Because even when you think you get it, and you think, God, isn't that great? Net positive is so much more exciting than just being zero. And you think, that's it, I've got it. And people look at you and say, so what's net positive again? You're thinking, ah, oh, I'm sure I've told you this twice. <laughs> the answer is you have to tell them about 10 times, I reckon, and just keep going after them. And it is, it is uh, you know, it might feel a bit dispiriting because you think you've got this wonderful, shiny message and everyone's going, yeah, yeah, whatever actually keep going at it because the evidence is people do get it and they are engaged by it, but it doesn't happen sort of like that. And the same is true, I think, with some of the messages that, that you give to the supply chain. There is a lot of interest in this, but, but the sheer time and effort it takes to, to develop it, it shouldn't be underestimated. Um, but I think the, the other two things I'd say is, one is it's really important to start with a vision and don't get freaked out by the fact you haven't got all the answers yet. You've just got to start and get going on some momentum uh, in certain areas. And <clears throat> if someone says to you, well, how will this work in 10 years' time? And you say, I don't know. Frankly, that's OK. As long as I know that's what I want to do, I just don't know exactly how I'm going to get there. But I've defined the mission to start with. <coughs> and if I've defined the mission, um, I can generate the networks of enthusiasm and people that will get me there because actually the idea resonates with people. And if you've got it right, if you've figured out your version of net positive that works commercially for your organization, there's actually a lot of latent energy out there, but you have to give it time and you have to really engage with it. I think that the final thing is, um, I would say is, is, is just be very, very open to the set of ideas. You know, how might you do this? Who might you do it with? How do you know? You, because this hasn't been done before, you're talking about a new, new sort of development in sustainability and in corporate responsibility. There aren't lots of textbooks. And this room probably contains 90% of the people on the planet who've thought about net positive. So this is very early days of uh, a really interesting movement. But I think the innovation requirement for this is absolutely fundamental because we can't maintain the same model. We have to find a different way of organizing business and a different footprint. So that, by definition, means changing the model. And that's incredibly hard to do when you're inside the model. So finding people who can link you to new ideas, new challenges, new ways of working, and actually being open enough about that and not getting too stressed about it, 
I think is, makes for a, a, quite a scary journey, but a fantastic journey once you get going on it. So just to finish, um, I think this is uh, a movement whose time is coming. I think there's going to be all sorts of stops and starts, but actually I think this is the way you have to go. And I think ultimately it's because we all want to work and be working with people we like in a business we're proud of. And I think this is the only way you're going to be able to do it going forward. Thanks very much.